a quick sustainability tip. I won't be buying regular plastic toothpaste because you cannot recycle it. So how is it that doing something like this helps you live more sustainably? More sustainable choices don't always have to be hard or expensive. Welcome to CGTN America's Global Action Initiative 2021, Project Earth, focusing on climate change. When we discuss ways to save the planet, we think big, think about governments and policies. But we can also, as climate experts say, think small about what we as global citizens can do to reduce our carbon footprint. The internet is filled with tips and hacks to save the environment. We will take a look at them later. We'll talk with people who are adopting a greener lifestyle. But first, let's talk trash. The United States produces more garbage than any other country in the world. That's nearly 300 million tons each year. It has tripled from when the U.S. government started keeping records in 1960. But there are people looking for ways to cut back and even to live entirely trash-free. A New York City grocery store aims to do just that. Katerina Bogatareva's journey to a low trash lifestyle started in 2015 when she began looking for ways to cut down the waste she produced at home. The challenge was that I had to go from one store to another to try to seek out options for buying products with a reasonable packaging or no, no packaging at all. So the idea came to my mind that it would be nice to have a store where you can just go and buy everything you need you know, in that kind of format. But it took three years to find enough package-free vendors to open her shop in New York. Today, everything here is sold in reusable glass or material containers, and customers are encouraged to bring their own tubs, jars, and non-plastic carrier bags. It's all part of Katerina's aim to help others live more eco-friendly lives. U.S. government data finds the average American generates nearly five pounds of trash a day. More than 23% of that is paper, but food and plastics also make up a large proportion of the items thrown away. Katerina admits it takes a lot of effort to cut down. We order very little. We order from local pr producers. She pays for a composting service that collects four of these bins every month. And any plastic that comes into the store is sent to a special company for recycling. Katerina says it isn't cheap, but it is invaluable to achieving her goals. Our first year, which was 2019 full year, we produced five trash bags in a whole year. But living a low-waste lifestyle isn't easy, and COVID-19 made it even harder. So 2020 was a challenging year because <laughs> we had to use a lot of gloves, especially in the beginning of pandemic when it was very chaotic and people were just afraid of touching the surfaces, having anything exposed. So uh, definitely affected. Um, I think it's right now bouncing back. And for those now looking to change their trash habits, Katerina says it's best to start small. I think some of the things that for me personally were easy, easy swap in the way was just that same water bottle or um, the paper towels, um, just use rags and instead, or um, something as simple as switching to a bar shampoo. Katerina says a zero trash lifestyle isn't for everyone, but even little changes can make a big difference to the world. Sarah Walton, CGTN, New York. So how is it that doing something like this helps you live more sustainably? It's a mindset. Every last drop of product you savor, every takeout container you reuse, every jar you refill, every outfit you rewear, every reusable you choose, well, it all adds up. This was one of the many examples you can find online of how you can reduce waste and help save the planet. Rochelle Akufa, host of CGTN's Global Business, has more tips. Thanks, Anand. Now, I'm here with CGTN Zach Duns, who leads a new TikTok account called The Optimist, which focuses on actions that everyone can take to help fight climate change. Now, Zach, as we've seen in this story about the grocery store in New York, it's really hard to live without producing trash, especially plastics. It's impossible. I mean, this is just the reality of the world that we live in now. And it's something that a lot of people want to do something about, but they don't have any idea how. And that's the main idea of the TikTok channel. One of the reasons that we chose TikTok as the platform for this is because climate change is something that young people are going to be affected by the most, you know? Even though they're not the ones who caused this problem, they're the ones who are inheriting it, and so we want to make things that are directly appealing to them. And I understand that uh, you've done a TikTok video on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about daily plastic use in particular. Let's take a look. This morning I woke up and decided, I'm going to count how many single-use plastics I use today. 
I started the day with a good shave, followed by brushing my teeth, washing my hands, and putting in my contact lenses. After that, it was time for a shower with lots of different shampoo, conditioner, body wash, and all of that. I washed my clothes, unclogged the drain, and made my breakfast, which consisted of sourdough bread, butter, eggs, oil, cheese, and sriracha. I took my vitamins, I washed the dishes, I put some roll on, and I began my workday by cleaning my computer screen. I also checked my mail, which uses a surprising amount of plastic. Before long, it was lunchtime. I made this wonderful beef stew, which was delicious, but it had to use a lot of plasticky ingredients to be created. Next, it was time for a quick stroll where I went and got some Starbucks coffee, complete with the lid and the plastic stopper. It was barely lunchtime and I was already over 40. Plastic is an inescapable part of our lives. It's horrible for the environment, but we can't live without it. I don't shame anyone at all for using plastics, but the reality is only about 9% of plastics are actually being recycled. The rest end up in places like this. We need legislation to create limitations and restrictions on plastics. Who's with me? I mean, it really is mind-boggling the amount of plastics that we come into contact with and use in our everyday lives. I'm sure many people are going to try that experiment at home. Now, Zach, for many people, it is a choice between saving the planet or saving money. Usually some of these products and solutions that are more eco-friendly do tend to be more expensive. Yeah, that's the reality of it, too. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to do the more eco-friendly option, but it's, it's not even just the cost necessarily. It also has to do with accessibility. Now, I did make a video about that as well. Let's take, take a look. Is living sustainably worth the extra cost? Check this out. I can get two bottles of Gain on Amazon for $13.88 or $6.94 each. After it was done, I decided to try out this refill station close to my home, which sells detergent by the pound. Filling up the same bottle, it cost me $8.44. That's an even $1.50 extra per bottle. Let's assume liberally that I use about 20 of these bottles a year. Refilling would mean I'm out an extra $30. But that's also 19 fewer plastic bottles sitting in a landfill or floating around in the ocean. By the way, it's estimated that only 9% of plastics actually end up recycled. Also, the more of us who do this, the more the price can drop, making it more affordable for everyone. And this doesn't stop at detergent, it's available for soap, shampoo, and more. All of this considered, what's your opinion about this question? Is living sustainably worth the extra cost? Now, Rochelle, that video got a lot of attention. It almost hit 4 million views on TikTok because it's a perfect example of something that people can do to make a change in their lives. and. They're just curious, you know? It's something maybe that they've never heard of before. And it is one of those things we have to do, sort of balance. You know, you feel guilty about not buying the more eco-friendly thing, but it's like, oh, but, you know, you're trying to save a bit of money. Now, of course, it's not just videos. There are also apps that help people save the environment as well. Yeah, absolutely. I have a couple that I'd like to recommend to you today. One of my favorites is called Too Good To Go. That's a food, uh, food sustainability app. So the way that it works is restaurants will sign up for it. Then at the end of the day, they'll put all of their food that they have left over on the app. And you can go and you can pick it up. You can get a restaurant level meal for two or three dollars just because the alternative for them is throwing that meal away. I love that app. The other one that I like is called Good On You. It's an app that's all about clothing and the sustainability and ecology of clothing. So it helps rate different clothing brands based on how sustainable they are, what materials they're using, you know, where they're getting those materials from and things like that. And it's interesting because a lot of times people just don't know what they don't know. You don't know that these things are available, these sort of shops and resources. Mm -hmm. So then in terms of the sort of topics and questions that you get the most engagement on, what are people most interested in? You know, all sorts of topics. Like one video really that was interesting recently was about electric vehicles. I posted one and sort of the thesis of the video was why aren't more people buying electric vehicles? You know, they're slowly becoming more and more affordable for people. Uh, they're much better for the environment than gas vehicles. And, you know, people, uh, there was a lot of mix in there, but people mostly just didn't want to make that change. You know, it's a major lifestyle change. There aren't a lot of charging stations around that people are aware of. And, you know, it's just the convenience of the life that we've gotten used to so far. And these are the types of changes that we need to face head on if we're going to tackle this problem. Well, Zach, lots of fantastic tips there. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, if you're interested in checking out The Optimist, just search The Optimist on TikTok. Vulnerability to climate change is gender. It is a fact that climate change disproportionately impacts women and girls, especially in developing and least developed countries and small island developing countries. Gender inequalities in terms of access to finance and other productive assets, technology, knowledge, and mobility, among others, do constrain women and girls' ability to respond to, to climate change. It is 
critical that women's participation and leadership be supported in all climate-related decision-making processes, from the local to, to global. is on Glasgow right now during the intense diplomatic negotiations by almost 200 countries on how to tackle the common challenge of intensifying global warming. But scientists are not optimistic that we will keep global temperatures from rising by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. This is one of the goals of the Paris Accord. There's a lot of what governments can do in terms of policies, but there's also a lot of what you can do. Small actions can have a big impact, especially if coupled with economic and political pressure on companies and politicians. To talk more about that, let's bring in our panel from California. Peter Kalmus is a climate scientist and author of the book Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. Also from California, Crystal Chazelle is a senior director at the Drawdown Communities. Alejandra Pollack joins us from New York. She is a board member at the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Welcome to all of you to the program. Peter, let me start with you. One of the subtitles of your book is, What Can One Being, You, Do About Global Warming? Give us an example of what are some of the small things individuals can do to make an impact. Well, actually, one of the things I say is that you should try to look for the biggest things that you can do by understanding what you, how your actions relate to your emissions. Um, now, I should say also that this is something that anyone can do who's feeling terrified or angry or anxious about um, global heating and frustrated that um, world leaders aren't doing enough to stop it. So as you're, you know, as you're expressing that anger and frustration in other ways by political pressure, as you said, you can also at the same time be looking at how your own actions relate to emissions. For me, the two biggest things were to fly less, and eventually I stopped flying in 2012. That was like three quarters of my, uh, my own emissions. So most people don't understand how much flying really emits. And it's also interesting to see how, you know, things that we, some, how our actions kind of intersect with uh, the systems that we're, we're all caught in. And that's especially apparent in food. So. Um, becoming vegetarian and, uh, and eventually going towards a more and more plant-based diet. Um, I was vegan for about a year. Uh, COVID got me eating a little bit of uh, dairy. Um, but that, that was the second biggest thing. And anyone can do that. Um. <laughs> now, some solutions that would reduce your carbon footprint and your utility bill are just at the press of a button. Zach Dance has another tip for us. Next time you're washing your clothes, consider using a cold, cold wash. This can reduce the energy output by 90%, which means it's better for your electric bill and for the environment. Cold water washing also means that your clothes are a lot less likely to shrink or fade. Follow for more tips like this. So, Peter, that was one example given to us uh, by our digital producer there, Zach Dance, telling us that we should use cold water to wash our clothing uh, in uh, washing machines. That would save uh, a lot of energy. That would make a contribution towards combating climate change. Uh, you've changed your lifestyle. You were telling us a bit about that uh, yourself. But I mean, if you take some things like you've decided you won't fly as much as you would, that's not going to be easy for a lot of people, right? Well, that, that's true. And also, um, you know, I've been, I've, I've been looking at my own emissions over the last 10 years. I made drastic reductions. One of the things I've learned over that time, which is actually a little bit depressing, is that very, very few people will make any of these changes voluntarily. And when they do make the changes, they'll make the, the really easy ones, like cold water washing, that don't re require any commitment, which is, again, why we need political action. I mean, as a climate scientist, the emergency we're in, I believe the public doesn't understand uh, nearly how serious it is. Um, so it's, it's almost strange to be having this particular conversation in 2021, when we have six years of carbon budget left uh, to try to stay under one and a half degrees of global heating. And I will also say as a climate scientist that I'm actually quite concerned that one and a half degrees of global heating is going to be a lot worse than uh, we all think. So I don't, I'm concerned that that will not be a safe level. 
Crystal, your organization, Drawdown, has an ambitious goal, not only to reduce the rise in greenhouse gas emissions, but also to bring down the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Tell us more about that. So our team at Project Drawdown has used mathematical modeling to predict whether it's possible to reach this point of um, drawdown where the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere begin to decline. And to do that, we've looked at a full range of climate solutions across five sectors of, of human activity, a total of 80 solutions, projected adoption of those solutions over a 30-year period, and then calculated whether it's possible to reach drawdown. So I think that um, it is possible. That's what our, our research and modeling shows, that it's possible to reach that point by 2050. And that's if we aggressively adopt a full range of climate solutions. So now, Drawdown also has tips on how citizens um, can help with that. I mean, what are the most important ones? The most important ones are those that can have the biggest impact on either preventing emissions of greenhouse gases, so that's gases going up into the atmosphere, and also supporting the natural processes that draw those gases out of the atmosphere. One of the biggest opportunities is changing our habits around food, and this will prevent methane emissions and um, and also carbon dioxide emissions. So there's a large impact from reducing our food waste. Mm -hmm. About 30% of food is wasted in the United States. When this goes into landfills and rots, it creates methane emissions. So we can look at how can we reduce the amount of food we're wasting. We can also look at reducing our meat eating because meat production, especially on large factory farming scales, produces large amounts of methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide when we have to clear forests to raise more meat. So it's not even necessary to become a vegan. Mm -hmm. If we Project Drawdown calculated the effect of reducing your meat eating by only 50%, and there's still a large impact to be had. When we drive a car, we're putting gasoline into it. Unless we have an electric car, um, cars run on gasoline. So we, we can look at opportunities to reduce the amount of trips we take in a car, substituting with walking, biking, public transportation, or carpooling, then we can see the opportunity. So I think that when you understand what produces the emissions, burning of fossil fuels, then you can use more of your own thinking to determine what's best in your life to reduce emissions. So it's really, it's entirely possible for everyone to have a contribution. Now, people around the world are concerned with climate change and companies are too as well. Let's check another tip posted on TikTok. Here's a quick sustainability tip. Sometimes our shoes get dirty and it's great if you get shoes that are made to last and that you can clean easily. But it's also great to shop from companies that consider the circularity of their products, like Chaco, which has their ReChaco repair program where their team can repair or replace parts of your Chacos. Because the most sustainable products aren't disposable, they're repairable. Okay, let's bring Alejandra into the conversation. Alejandra, we just saw an example there of how a company moves towards sustainability. Uh, how important is this kind of shift for companies? Oh, it's incredibly important. Um, it's difficult to understate the impact that the apparel and footwear industry has globally. Uh, from a climate change perspective, uh, the apparel industry is responsible for between 4 and 8 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, which means if we take the low estimate, the 4 percent, uh, the apparel industry is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than Germany, the United Kingdom, and France combined. And so we do need uh, companies to start shifting uh, their business models, yes, towards more more circular ones, um, where they are taking more responsibility for producing uh, 
apparel and footwear that is made uh, with quality in mind, that is made to be worn for a lifetime and passed down for generations. Unfortunately, what we have been seeing is a trend in the opposite direction. We've been seeing clothing of decreased quality um, that is designed and marketed uh, to be disposed of, to be consumed and disposed of quickly. Um, and that model uh, globally is having, is really wreaking havoc on our environment from a climate change perspective, from a water pollution perspective, and from a waste management perspective. Um, and so, you know, our other panelists covered, you know, some of the individual actions that, that we can be taking. Um, and I think that it's important to look at our relationship with consumption and, yes, demand better from brands. I think that we have to see that consumer demand for more sustainable products and push the industry in that direction. But that push also has to be coupled with a push for more regulation. And Alejandra, uh, consumers can make a difference by supporting these companies, right? Uh, you know, because, I mean, there's some companies who say, look, uh, for every product we sell, we'll plant a tree. Uh, and of course, the point that you made, um, to reduce consumption altogether. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that it's important to support kind of North Star brands that have been leading in sustainability and have been really paving the path towards a more sustainable future for the apparel industry. Um, but again, as consumers, it's very important that we not just seek to replace our existing levels of consumption with the, con with the same levels of consumption of perceived uh, or uh, perceived sustainable apparel and footwear. Uh, it's very important that our relationship with consumption is, you know, in the context of reducing it altogether. Peter, you tweeted recently, uh, few people understand how important climate action is. I mean, there is a tendency among people to say, look, all of this is somebody else's problem. How does one change that? Well, um, that's the that's the trillion dollar question, really. Um, I I think Greta Thunberg is bang on when she says she wants people to panic, um, because fear is something that causes us to actually change. What I'm trying to do is to let the world know <laughs> that we're really in an emergency and we're not acting like we're in an emergency. I think the kinds of actions that we're talking about right now would have been much more helpful in the 1990s when we still had time for kind of an incremental and graceful uh, exit from the climate emergency. I mean, it's just, to me, it's stunning how, how little time we have left right now, um, even to try to maintain one and a half degrees of global heating, which, as I said, I think is probably going to be a lot more devastating than most people think. And so, again, I just I want people to get really angry at the inaction. Um, I want to see a billion climate activists out in the street uh, holding politicians to account, expressing their anger every chance they get, um, and really creating political space for the kinds of policies that we need. Again, 10 years ago, when I started looking at my individual emissions, there wasn't very much of a climate movement, and, and I found that discouraging. And that's part of why I was like, well, I'm not sure what else to do, so at least I'm going to examine where my emissions are coming from and change them. Now there is a climate movement, so really the best action anyone can take is to join with community groups, join with climate action groups, um, you know, raise their voices, into a collective voice um, demanding change, uh, not asking politely for it anymore. Because really, I, I would say the, the future of uh, the Earth, um, of non-humans, I study coral reefs. We're on the verge of losing all coral reefs on the planet. Um, and the, fut the collective future of humanity for the next hundreds, thousands, maybe of generations is really being determined right now. Now, as I said earlier, world leaders are gathered in Glasgow, Scotland, to discuss ways to save the environment. The problem is to find agreement between nations. Here's the Hungarian Foreign Minister, Peter Sahatsi. Yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, climate, which could be another uh, issue of um, respect-based cooperation between East and West, since we have a common goal. 
and a common enemy, uh, which is uh, which is the uh, increasing temperature uh, in the world, we could work together. Uh, the problem is that um, uh, that for some reason cooperation in this regard is not uh, perfect yet. We still need a lot of financial resources uh, mobilized uh, in order to enable the uh, less developed countries uh, to take part in this uh, global um, performance or, um, or global approach. And, uh, and I hope that in Scotland uh, we'll, uh, bring, we'll bring some uh, forward progress uh, in this uh, regard also without helping the less uh, developed countries, without uh, uh, giving them or allocating them the necessary financial resources, uh, it's not going to be possible to have this fight successful. Crystal, there are people who are concerned with the impact of climate change, but how does one translate that concern into political power, power at the polls? How do we get people who are eco-friendly to be elected? Well, I think that um we have to recognize that our elected officials, especially on the local level, are citizens just like us. Running for office does not necessarily mean that you're an expert on climate change. So our local elected officials need to be educated along with us. And um, I totally agree with Peter about the importance of collective action, but I do have a little bit of a different perspective on the importance of panic. So I think that, yes, we need our full range of emotions right now, but we also need to embrace our humanity more than ever, develop good relationships with others, work together with others, and that we can gather a great momentum for the change that we all need to make in our lives at every level of society, up through national government. But I think we can do that when we can also bring into play our joy, our love for one another, happiness, the positive emotions that will propel us forward in making changes. And we can call on that best when we work together with others. I completely agree, by the way. <laughs> and emotions are complicated. They, they come and they go and they're, they're mixtures and you feel different things at different times. And um, you know, the grief that I think a lot of us feel actually comes out of love um, and comes out of a sense of what we're losing and a desire to prevent further loss. And one thing that I do want everyone to understand, all the listeners, is that um, no matter how bad it gets, uh, this is just the physics, right? Every, basically every day we lose more, and that'll be true until we completely stop um, burning fossil fuels and emitting greenhouse gases because they accumulate in the atmosphere and they stay there right. for a very long time. Alejandro, you were talking earlier on about the regulatory mechanisms that we have at our disposal, or perhaps that we don't have at our disposal. Uh, what can citizens do to fight for more regulatory oversight over companies, uh, over industries? I mean, how difficult is that? Because we know about the power that lobbying groups have right now. Oh, absolutely. They have a tremendous power, as we can see, uh, given uh, the fact that it's become incredibly difficult to pass uh, climate change uh, policies at the federal level in, a, in this divided Congress. We're seeing the influence of these lobbying groups uh, play out in full force. We need to start in parallel to addressing our domestic emissions and focusing on electri electrifying our grid and moving you know, to uh, using more electric vehicles. We also need to start considering the embodied carbon footprint of the consumer goods that are mm -hmm. sold to us. And as consumers, or I like to say as constituents, uh, we can engage our local politicians at the, at the, at the state and local level um, and, 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 and engage them and let them know that, that those are issues that we care about, that we care about the adverse environmental and social impacts of the products that are sold to us. And just to, just to add you know, to Crystal um, and Peter's points, you know, I'm, I'm a mom to a two and a half year old daughter. I have to have hope. You know, I cannot descend into a rabbit hole of, uh, you know, apocalyptic uh, feelings about this. Um, so I take the the sense of urgency that we ha that that we all share and just translate that into solutions. And you'll you'll start seeing that the more you get engaged at the local level and start to um, you know build hope. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's all the time we have, but we'd like to thank our experts and our audience for more of our GAI content. 
Check out our website at www.globalactioninitiative.com. You'll find full episodes of all our daily shows, exclusive documentaries focused on climate change, speeches and interviews with our VIP guests, and feature stories on everyday heroes fighting to save the planet. And if you're really in a hurry, just scan the QR code with your mobile phone. We hope we've been able to shed some light on what remains one of the most intractable problems of our time.